Chapter One, Part One of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Chapter One Variation Under Domestication Causes of Variability Effects of Habit and the Use and Disuse of Parts Correlated Variation Inheritance Character of Domestic Varieties Difficulty of Distinguishing Between Varieties and Species Origin of Domestic Varieties from One or More Species Domestic Pigeons, Their Differences and Origin Principles of Selection, Anciently Followed, Their Effects Methodical and Unconscious Selection Unknown Origin of Our Domestic Productions Circumstances Favorable to Man's Power of Selection Causes of Variability When we compare the individuals of the same variety or sub-variety of our older cultivated plants and animals, one of the first points which strikes us is that they generally differ more from each other than do the individuals of any one species or variety in a state of nature. And if we reflect on the vast diversity of the plants and animals which have been cultivated, and which have varied during all ages under the most different climates and treatments, we are driven to conclude that this great variability is due to our domestic productions having been raised under conditions of life not so uniform as somewhat different from those to which the parent species had been exposed under nature. There is also some probability in the view propounded by andrew knight that this variability may be partly connected with excess of food it seems clear that organic beings must be exposed during several generations to new conditions to cause any great amount of variation and that when the organization has once begun to vary it generally continues varying for many generations no case is on record of a variable organism ceasing to vary under cultivation our oldest cultivated plants, such as wheat, still yield new varieties. Our oldest domesticated animals are still capable of rapid improvement or modification. As far as I am able to judge, after long attending to the subject, the conditions of life appear to act in two ways, directly on the whole organization or on certain parts alone, and indirectly by affecting the reproductive system with respect to the direct action we must bear in mind that in every case as professor wiseman has lately insisted and as i have incidentally shown in my work on variation under domestication there are two factors namely the nature of the organism and the nature of the conditions the former seems to be much the more important, for nearly similar variations sometimes arise under, as far as we can judge, dissimilar conditions. And, on the other hand, dissimilar variations arise under conditions which appear to be nearly uniform. The effects on the offspring are either definite or indefinite. They may be considered as definite when all or nearly all the offspring of individuals exposed to certain conditions during several generations are modified in the same manner. It is extremely difficult to come to any conclusion in regard to the extent of the changes which have been thus definitely induced. There can, however, be little doubt about many slight changes, such as size from the amount of food, color from the nature of the food, the thickness of the skin, and hair from climate, etc. Each of the endless variations which we see in the plumage of our fowls must have had some efficient cause, and if the same cause were to act uniformly during a long series of generations on many individuals, all probably would be modified in the same manner. Such facts as the complex and extraordinary outgrowths which variably follow from the insertion of a minute drop of poison by a gall-producing insect, shows us what singular modifications might result in the case of plants from a chemical change in the nature of the sap. Indefinite variability is a much more common result of changed conditions than definite variability and has probably played a more important part in the formation of our domestic races. 
we see indefinite variability in the endless slight peculiarities which distinguish the individuals of the same species and which cannot be accounted for by inheritance from either parent or from some more remote ancestor even strongly marked differences occasionally appear in the young of the same litter and in seedlings from the same seed capsule at long intervals of time out of millions of individuals reared in the same country and fed on nearly the same food deviations of structure so strongly pronounced as to deserve to be called monstrosities arise but monstrosities cannot be separated by any distinct line from slighter variations all such changes of structure whether extremely slight or strongly marked which appear among many individuals living together may be considered as the indefinite effects of the conditions of life on each individual organism in nearly the same manner as the chill effects different men in an indefinite manner according to their state of body or constitution causing coughs or colds rheumatism or inflammation of various organs with respect to what i have called the indirect action of changed conditions namely through the reproductive system of being affected we may infer that variability is thus induced partly from the fact of this system being extremely sensitive to any change in the conditions and partly from the similarity as Kolruder and others have remarked between the variability which follows from the crossing of distinct species and that which may be observed with plants and animals when reared under new or unnatural conditions nothing is more easy than to tame an animal and few things are more difficult than to get it to breed freely under confinement even when the male and female unite how many animals there are which will not breed though kept in an almost free state in their native country this is generally but erroneously attributed to vitiated instincts many cultivated plants display the utmost vigor and yet rarely or never seed in some few cases it has been discovered that a very trifling change such as a little more or less water at some particular period of growth will determine whether or not a plant will produce seeds i cannot here give the details which i have collected and elsewhere published on this curious subject but to show how singular the laws are which determine the reproduction of animals under confinement i may mention that carnivorous animals even from the tropics breed in this country pretty freely under confinement with the exception of the plantigrades or bear family which seldom produce young whereas carnivorous birds with the rarest exception hardly ever lay fertile eggs many exotic plants have pollen utterly worthless in the same condition as in the most sterile hybrids when on the one hand we see domesticated animals and plants though often weak and sickly breeding freely under confinement and when on the other hand we see individuals though taken young from a state of nature perfectly tamed long-lived and healthy of which i could give numerous instances yet having their reproductive system so seriously affected by unperceived causes as to fail to act we need not be surprised at the system when it does act under confinement acting irregularly and producing offspring somewhat unlike their parents i may add that as some organisms breed freely under the most unnatural conditions for instance rabbits and ferrets kept in hutches showing that their reproductive organs are not easily affected so will some animals and plants withstand domestication or cultivation and vary very slightly perhaps hardly more than in a state of nature some naturalists have maintained that all variations are connected with the act of sexual reproduction but this is certainly an error for i have given in another work a long list of quote, sporting plants end quote, as they are called by gardeners that is of plants which have suddenly produced a single bud with a new and sometimes widely different character from that of the other buds on the same plant these bud variations as they may be named can be propagated by grafts offsets etc and sometimes by seed they occur rarely under nature but are far from rare under culture 
as a single bud out of many thousands produced year after year on the same tree under uniform conditions has been known suddenly to assume a new character and as buds on distinct trees growing under different conditions have sometimes yielded nearly the same variety for instance buds on peach trees producing nectarines and buds on common roses producing moss roses we clearly see that the nature of the conditions is of subordinate importance in comparison with the nature of the organism in determining each particular form of variation perhaps of not more importance than the nature of the spark by which a mass of combustible matter is ignited has in determining the nature of the flames effect of habit and the use or disuse of parts correlated variation inheritance changed habits produce an inherited effect as in the period of the flowering of plants when transported from one climate to another with animals the increased use or disuse of parts has had a more marked influence thus i find in the domestic duck that the bones of the wing weigh less and the bones of the leg more in proportion to the whole skeleton than do the same bones in the wild duck and this change may be safely attributed to the domestic duck flying much less and walking more than its wild parents the great and inherited development of the udders in cows and goats in countries where they are habitually milked in comparison with these organs in other countries is probably another instance of the effects of use not one of our domestic animals can be named which has not in some country drooping ears and the view which has been suggested that the drooping is due to disuse of the muscles of the ear from the animals being seldom much alarmed seems probable many laws regulate variation some few of which can be dimly seen and will hereafter be briefly discussed i will here only allude to what may be called correlated variation important changes in the embryo or larva will probably entail changes in the mature animals in monstrosities the correlations between quite distinct parts are very curious and many instances are given in isidore geoffroy saint hilaire's great work on this subject readers believe that long limbs are almost always accompanied by an elongated head some instances of correlation are quite whimsical thus cats which are entirely wide and have blue eyes are generally deaf but it has been lately stated by mr tate that this is confined to the males color and constitutional peculiarities go together of which many remarkable cases could be given among animals and plants from facts collected by Husinger, it appears that white sheep and pigs are injured by certain plants while dark-colored individuals escape professor wyman has recently communicated to me a good illustration of this fact on asking some farmers in virginia how it was that all their pigs were black they informed him that the pigs ate the paint root lachnanthes which colored their bones pink and which caused the hoofs of all but the black varieties to drop off and one of the quote, crackers i e virginia squatters added quote, we select the black members of litter for raising as they alone have a good chance of living End quote. hairless dogs have imperfect teeth long-haired and coarse-haired animals are apt to have as is asserted long or many horns pigeons with feathered feet have skin between their outer toes pigeons with short beaks have small feet and those with long beaks large feet hence if man goes on selecting and thus augmenting any peculiarity he will almost certainly modify unintentionally the other parts of the structure owing to the mysterious laws of correlation the results of the various unknown or but dimly understood laws of variation are infinitely complex and diversified 
it is well worth while carefully to study the several treatises on some of our old cultivated plants as on the hyacinth potato even the dahlia etc and it is really surprising to note the endless points of structure and constitution in which the varieties and sub-varieties differ slightly from each other the whole organization seems to have become plastic and departs in a slight degree from that of the parental type any variation which is not inherited is unimportant for us but the number and diversity of inheritable deviations of structure both those of slight and those of considerable physiological importance are endless dr prosper lucas's treatise in two large volumes is the fullest and the best on this subject no breeder doubts how strong is the tendency to inheritance that like reduces like is his fundamental belief doubts have been thrown on this principle only by theoretical writers when any deviation of structure often appears and we see it in the father and child we cannot tell whether it may not be due to the same cause having acted on both but when among individuals apparently exposed to the same conditions any very rare deviation due to some extraordinary combination of circumstances appears in the parent say once among several million individuals and it reappears in the child the mere doctrine of chances almost compels us to attribute its reappearance to inheritance every one must have heard of cases of albinism prickly skin hairy bodies etc appearing in several members of the same family if strange and rare deviations of structure are truly inherited less strange and commoner deviations may be freely admitted to be inheritable perhaps the correct way of viewing the whole subject would be to look at the inheritance of every character whatever as the rule and non-inheritance as the anomaly the laws governing inheritance are for the most part unknown no one can say why the same peculiarity in different individuals of the same species or in different species is sometimes inherited and sometimes not so why the child often reverts in certain characteristics to its grandfather or grandmother or more remote ancestor why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes or to one sex alone more commonly but not exclusively to the like sex it is a fact of some importance to us that peculiarities appearing in the males of our domestic breeds are often transmitted either exclusively or in a much greater degree to the males alone a much more important rule which i think may be trusted is that at whatever period of life a peculiarity first appears it tends to reappear in the offspring at a corresponding age though sometimes earlier in many cases this could not be otherwise thus the inherited peculiarities in the horns of cattle could appear only in the offspring when nearly mature peculiarities in the silkworm are known to appear at the corresponding caterpillar or cocoon stage but hereditary diseases and some other facts make me believe that the rule has a wider extension and that when there is no apparent reason why a peculiarity should appear at any particular age yet that it does tend to appear in the offspring at the same period at which it first appeared in the parent i believe this rule to be of the highest importance in explaining the laws of embryology these remarks are of course confined to the first appearance of the peculiarity and not to the primary cause which may have acted on the ovules or on the male element in nearly the same manner as the increased length of the horns in the offspring from a short-horned cow by a long-horned bull though appearing late in life is clearly due to the male element having alluded to the subject of reversion i may here refer to a statement often made by naturalists namely that our domestic varieties when run wild gradually but invariably revert in character to their aboriginal stocks hence it has been argued that no deductions can be drawn from domestic races to species 
in a state of nature. I have in vain endeavoured to discover on what decisive facts the above statement has so often and so boldly been made. There would be great difficulty in proving its truth. We may safely conclude that very many of the most strongly marked domestic varieties could not possibly live in a wild state. In many cases we do not know what the aboriginal stock was, and so could not tell whether, or not, nearly perfect reversion had ensued. It would be necessary, in order to prevent the effects of intercrossing, that only a single variety should be turned loose in its new home. Nevertheless, as our varieties certainly do occasionally revert in some of their characters to ancestral forms, it seems to me not improbable that if we could succeed in naturalizing, or were to cultivate, during many generations, the several races, for instance, of the cabbage, in very poor soil, in which case, however, some effect would have to be attributed to the definite action of the poor soil, that they would, to a large extent, or even wholly, revert to the wild aboriginal stock. Whether or not the experiment would succeed is not of great importance for our line of argument, for by the experiment itself the conditions of life are changed. If it could be shown that our domestic varieties manifested a strong tendency to reversion, that is, to lose their acquired characters, while kept under the same conditions, and while kept in a considerable body, so that free intercrossing might check, by blending together, any slight deviations in their structure, in such case, I grant that we could deduce nothing from domestic varieties in regard to species but there is not a shadow of evidence in favour of this view. To assert that we could not breed our cart and racehorses, long and short-horned cattle, and poultry of various breeds, and esculent vegetables, for an unlimited number of generations, would be opposed to all experience. Character of Domestic Varieties Difficulty of Distinguishing Between Varieties and Species Origin of domestic varieties from one or more species. When we look to the hereditary varieties, or races, of our domestic animals and plants, and compare them with closely allied species, we generally perceive in each domestic race, as already remarked, less uniformity of character than in true species. Domestic races often have a somewhat monstrous character by which I mean that, although differing from each other, and from other species of the same genus, in several trifling respects, they often differ in an extreme degree, in some one part, both when compared one with another, and, more especially, when compared with the species under nature, to which they are nearest allied. With these exceptions, and with that of the perfect fertility of varieties when crossed, a subject hereafter to be discussed, domestic races of the same species differ from each other in the same manner as do the closely allied species of the same genus in a state of nature, but the differences in most cases are less in degree. This must be admitted as true, for the domestic races of many animals and plants have been ranked by some competent judges as the descendants of aboriginally distinct species and by other competent judges as mere varieties. If any well-marked distinction existed between a domestic race and a species, this source of doubt would not so perpetually recur. It has often been stated that domestic races do not differ from each other in characters of generic value. It can be shown that this statement is not correct, but naturalists differ much in determining what characters are of generic value, all such valuations being, at present, empirical. When it is explained how genera originate under nature, it will be seen that we have no right to expect often to find a generic amount of difference in our domesticated races. In attempting to estimate the amount of structural difference between allied domestic races, we are soon involved in doubt from not knowing whether they are descended from one or several parent species. This point, 
if it could be cleared up, would be interesting if, for instance, it could be shown that the greyhound, bloodhound, terrier, spaniel, and bulldog, which we all know propagate their kind truly, were the offspring of any single species, then such facts would have great weight in making us doubt about the immutability of the many closely allied natural species, for instance, of the many foxes, inhabiting the different quarters of the world. But do not believe, as we shall presently see, that the whole amount of difference between the several breeds of the dog has been produced under domestication. I believe that a small part of the difference is due to their being descended from distinct species. In the case of strongly marked races of some other domesticated species, there is presumptive, or even strong, evidence that all are descended from a single wild stock. It has often been assumed that man has chosen for domestication animals and plants having an extraordinary inherent tendency to vary, and likewise to withstand diverse climates. I do not dispute that these capacities have added largely to the value of most of our domesticated productions, but how could a savage possibly know when he first tamed an animal, whether it would vary in succeeding generations, and whether it would endure other climates? Has the little variability of the ass and goose, or the small power of endurance by warmth by the reindeer, or of cold by the common camel, prevented their domestication? I cannot doubt that if other animals and plants equal in number to our domesticated productions, and belonging to equally diverse classes and countries, were taken from a state of nature, and could be made to breed for an equal number of generations under domestication, they would, on an average, vary as largely as the parent species of our existing domesticated productions have varied. In the case of most of our anciently domesticated animals and plants, it is not possible to come to any definite conclusion whether they are descended from one or several wild species. The argument mainly relied on by those who believe in the multiple origin of our domestic animals is that we find in the most ancient times, on the monuments of Egypt, and in the lake habitations of Switzerland, much diversity in the breeds, and that some of these ancient breeds closely resemble, or are even identical with, those still existing. But this only throws far backward the history of civilization and shows that animals were domesticated at a much earlier period than has hitherto been supposed. The lake inhabitants of Switzerland cultivated several kinds of wheat and barley, the pea, the poppy for oil, and flax, and they possessed several domesticated animals. They also carried on commerce with other nations. All this clearly shows, as here has remarked, that they had at this early age progressed considerably in civilization, and this again implies a long-continued previous period of less advanced civilization, during which the domesticated animals, kept by different tribes in different districts, might have varied and given rise to distinct races. Since the discovery of flint tools in the superficial formations of many parts of the world, all geologists believe that barbarian men existed at an enormously remote period, and we know that at the present day there is hardly a tribe so barbarous as not to have domesticated at least the dog. The origin of our most domestic animals will probably forever remain vague, but I may here state that, looking to the domestic dogs of the whole world, I have after a laborious collection of all known facts, come to the conclusion that several wild species of canidae have been tamed, and that their blood, in some cases, mingled together, flows in the veins of our domestic breeds. In regard to sheep and goats, I can form no decided opinion. From facts communicated to me by Mr. Blythe on the habits, voice, constitution, and structure 
of the humped Indian cattle, it is almost certain that they are descended from a different aboriginal stock from our European cattle, and some competent judges believe that these latter have had two or three wild progenitors, whether or not these deserve to be called species. This conclusion, as well as that of the specific distinction between the humped and common cattle, may, indeed, be looked upon as established by the admirable researches of Professor Rutemeyer. With respect to horses, from reasons which I cannot here give, I am doubtfully inclined to believe, in opposition to several authors, that all the races belong to the same species having kept nearly all the English breeds of the fowl alive, having bred and crossed them and examined their skeletons, it appeared to me almost certain that all are the descendants of the wild Indian fowl, Gallus Bankiva. And this is the conclusion of Mr. Blythe, and of others who have studied this bird in India. In regard to ducks and rabbits, some breeds of which differ much from each other, the evidence is clear that they are all descended from the common duck and wild rabbit. The doctrine of the origin of our several domestic races, from several aboriginal stocks, has been carried to an absurd extreme by some authors. They believe that every race which breeds true, let the distinctive characters be ever so slight, as had its wild prototype. At this rate there must have existed at least a score of species of wild cattle, as many sheep, and several goats, in Europe alone, and several even within Great Britain. One author believes that there formerly existed eleven wild species of sheep peculiar to Great Britain. When we bear in mind that Britain has now not one peculiar mammal, and France but a few distinct from those of Germany, and so with Hungary, Spain, etc., but that each of these kingdoms possesses several peculiar breeds of cattle, sheep, etc., we must admit that many domestic breeds must have originated in Europe, for whence otherwise could they have been derived? So it is in India, even in the case of the breeds of the domestic dog throughout the world, which I admit are descended from several wild species, it cannot be doubted that there has been an immense amount of inherited variation, for who will believe that animals closely resembling the Italian greyhound, the bloodhound, the bulldog, pug-dog, or Blenheim spaniel, etc., so unlike all wild canidae, ever existed in a state of nature? It has often been loosely said that all our races of dogs have been produced by the crossing of a few aboriginal species, but by crossing we can only get forms in some degree intermediate between their parents, and if we account for our several domestic races by this process, we must admit the former existence of the most extreme forms, as the Italian greyhound, bloodhound, bulldog, etc., in the wild state. Moreover, the possibility of making distinct races by crossing has been greatly exaggerated. Many cases are on record showing that a race may be modified by occasional crosses if aided by the careful selection of the individuals which present the desired character. But to obtain a race intermediate between two quite distinct races would be very difficult. Sir J. Seabright expressly experimented with this object and failed. The offspring from the first cross between two pure breeds is tolerably, and sometimes, as I have found with pigeons, quite uniform in character, and everything seems simple enough. But when these mongrels are crossed one with another for several generations, hardly two of them are alike, and then the difficulty of the task becomes manifest. Breeds of the Domestic Pigeon, Their Differences and Origin Believing that it is always best to study some special group, I have, after deliberation, 
taken up domestic pigeons. I have kept every breed which I could purchase or obtain, and have been most kindly favoured with skins from several quarters of the world, more especially by the Honourable W. Elliot from India, and by the Honourable C. Murray from Persia. Many treatises in different languages have been published on pigeons, and some of them are very important as being of considerable antiquity. I have associated with several eminent fanciers, and have been permitted to join two of the London Pigeon Clubs. The diversity of the breeds is something astonishing. Compare the English Carrier and the Short-Faced Tumbler, and see the wonderful difference in their beaks, entailing corresponding differences in their skulls. The Carrier, more especially the male bird, is also remarkable from the wonderful development of the carunculated skin about the head and this is accompanied by greatly elongated eyelids, very large external orifices to the nostrils, and a wide gape of mouth. The short-faced tumbler has a beak in outline almost like that of a finch, and the common tumbler has the singular inherited habit of flying at a great height in a compact flock, and tumbling in the air head over heels. The runt is a bird of great size, with long massive beak and large feet. Some of the sub-breeds of runs have very long necks, others have very long wings and tails, others singularly short tails. The barb is allied to the carrier, but instead of a long beak, has a very short and broad one. The powder has a much elongated body, wings, and legs, and its enormously developed crop, which it glories in inflating, may well excite astonishment, and even laughter. The turbot has a short and conical beak, with a line of reversed feathers down the breast, and it has a habit of continually expanding, slightly, the upper part of the esophagus. The jacobin has the feathers so much reversed along the back of the neck, that they form a hood, and it has, proportionally to its size, elongated wing and tail feathers. The trumpeter and laugher, as their names express, utter a very different coo from the other breeds. The fantail has thirty or even forty tail feathers instead of twelve or fourteen, the normal number in all the members of the great pigeon family. These feathers are kept expanded, and are carried so erect that in good birds the head and tail touch. The oil gland is quite aborted. Several other less distinct breeds might be specified. In the skeletons of the several breeds, the development of the bones of the face, in length and breadth, and curvature, differs enormously. The shape, as well as the breadth and length of the ramus of the lower jaw, varies in a highly remarkable manner. The caudal and sacral vertebrae vary in number, as does the number of the ribs together with their relative breadth and the presence of processes. The size and shape of the apertures in the sternum are highly variable. So is the degree of divergence and relative size of the two arms of the furcula, the proportional width of the gape of mouth, the proportional length of the eyelids, of the orifice of the nostrils, of the tongue, not always in strict correlation with the length of beak, the size of the crop, and of the upper part of the esophagus, the development and abortion of the oil gland, the number of the primary wing and caudal feathers, the relative length of the wing and tail to each other and to the body, the relative length of the leg and foot, the number of scutelli on the toes, the development of skin between the toes, are all points of structure which are variable. The period at which the perfect plumage is acquired varies, as does the state of the down with which the nestling birds are clothed when hatched. The shape and size of the eggs vary. The manner of flight, and in some breeds the voice and disposition differ remarkably. Lastly, in certain breeds, the males and females have come to differ in a slight degree from each other. Altogether, at least a score of pigeons might be chosen which, if shown to an ornithologist, 
and he were told that they were wild birds, would certainly be ranked by him as well-defined species. Moreover, I do not believe that any ornithologist would in this case place the English carrier, the short-faced tumbler, the runt, the barb, powder, and fantail in the same genus, more especially as in each of these breeds several truly inherited sub-breeds, or species, as he would call them, could be shown him. Great as are the differences between the breeds of the pigeon, I am fully convinced that the common opinion of naturalists is correct, namely, that all are descended from the rock pigeon, Columba Livia, including under this term several geographical races, or subspecies, which differ from each other in the most trifling respects. As several of the reasons which have led me to this belief are in some degree applicable in other cases, I will here briefly give them. If the several breeds are not varieties, and have not proceeded from the rock pigeon, they must have descended from at least seven or eight aboriginal stocks, for it is impossible to make the present domestic breeds by the crossing of any lesser number. How, for instance, could a powder be produced by crossing two breeds, unless one of the parent stocks possessed the characteristic enormous crop? The supposed aboriginal stocks must all have been rock pigeons, that is, they did not breed or willingly perch on trees, but besides Columba Livia, with its geographical subspecies, only two or three other species of rock pigeon are known, and these have not any of the characters of the domestic breeds. Hence, the supposed aboriginal stocks must either still exist in the countries where they were originally domesticated, and yet be unknown to ornithologists, and this, considering their size, habits, and remarkable characters, seems improbable, or they must have become extinct in the wild state. But birds, breeding on precipices, and good flyers, are unlikely to be exterminated, and the common rock pigeon, which has the same habits with the domestic breeds, has not been exterminated, even on several of the smaller British islets, or on the shores of the Mediterranean. Hence, the supposed extermination of so many species having similar habits with the rock pigeon seems a very rash assumption. Moreover, the several above-named domesticated breeds have been transported to all parts of the world, and therefore some of them must have been carried back again into their native country. But not one has become wild or feral, though the dovecot pigeon, which is the rock pigeon in a very slightly altered state, has become feral in several places. Again, all recent experience shows that it is difficult to get wild animals to breed freely under domestication, yet on the hypothesis of the multiple origin of our pigeons, it must be assumed that at least seven or eight species were so thoroughly domesticated in ancient times by half-civilized man as to be quite prolific under confinement. An argument of great weight, and applicable in several other cases, is that the above specified breeds, though agreeing generally with the wild rock pigeon in constitution, habits, voice, coloring, and in most parts of their structure, are certainly, yet are certainly, highly abnormal in other parts. We may look in vain through the whole great family of Columbidae for a beak like that of the English carrier, or that of the short-faced tumbler, or barb, for reversed feathers like those of the Jacobin, for a crop like that of the powder, for tail feathers like those of the fantail. Hence it must be assumed not only that half-civilized man succeeded in thoroughly domesticating several species, but that he intentionally, or by chance, picked out extraordinarily abnormal species, and, further, that these very species have since all become extinct or unknown. 
so many strange contingencies are improbable in the highest degree some facts in regard to the colouring of pigeons well deserve consideration the rock pigeon is of a slaty blue with white loins but the indian subspecies c intermedia of strickland has this part bluish the tail has a terminal dark bar with the outer feathers externally edged at the base with white the wings have two black bars some semi-domestic breeds and some truly wild breeds have besides the two black bars the wings checkered with black these several marks do not occur together in any other species of the whole family now in every one of the domestic breeds taking thoroughly well-bred birds all the above marks even to the white edging of the outer tail feathers sometimes concur perfectly developed moreover when birds belonging to two or more distinct breeds are crossed none of which are blue or have any of the above specified marks the mongrel offspring are very apt suddenly to acquire these characters to give one instance out of several which i have observed i crossed some white fantails which breed very true with some black barbs and it so happens that blue varieties of barbs are so rare that i never heard of an instance in england and the mongrels were black brown and mottled i also crossed a barb with a spot which is a white bird with a red tail and a red spot on the forehead and which notoriously breeds very true the mongrels were dusky and mottled i then crossed one of the mongrel barb fantails with a mongrel barb spot and they produced a bird of as beautiful a blue colour with the white loins double black wing bar and barred and white edged tail feathers as any wild rock pigeon we can understand these facts on the well-known principle of reversion to ancestral characters if all the domestic breeds are descended from the rock pigeon but if we deny this we must make one of the two following highly improbable suppositions either first that all the several imagined aboriginal stocks were coloured and marked like the rock pigeon although no other existing species is thus coloured and marked so that in each separate breed there might be a tendency to revert to the very same colours and markings or secondly that each breed even the purest has within a dozen or at most within a score of generations been crossed by the rock pigeon i say within a dozen or twenty generations for no instance is known of crossed descendants reverting to an ancestor of foreign blood removed by a greater number of generations in a breed which has been crossed only once the tendency to revert to any character derived from such a cross will naturally become less and less as in each succeeding generation there will be less of the foreign blood but when there has been no cross and there is a tendency in the breed to revert to a character which was lost during some former generation this tendency for all that we can see to the contrary may be transmitted undiminished for an indefinite number of generations these two distinct cases of reversion are often confounded together by those who have written on inheritance lastly the hybrids or mongrels from between all the breeds of the pigeon are perfectly fertile as i can state from my own observations purposely made on the most distinct breeds now hardly any cases have been ascertained with certainty of hybrids from two quite distinct species of animals being perfectly fertile some authors believe that long continued domestication eliminates this strong tendency to sterility in species from the history of the dog and of some other domestic animals this conclusion is probably quite correct if applied to species closely related to each other but to extend it so far as to suppose that species aboriginally as distinct as carriers tumblers powders and fantails now are 
should yield offspring perfectly fertile, inter se, seems to me rash in the extreme. From these several reasons, namely the improbability of man having formerly made seven or eight supposed species of pigeons to breed freely under domestication, these supposed species being quite unknown in a wild state, and their not having become anywhere feral, these species, presenting certain very abnormal characters, as compared with all other calamity, though so like the rock pigeon, in most other respects, the occasional reappearance of the blue colour and various black marks in all the breeds, both when kept pure and when crossed, and, lastly, the mongrel offspring being perfectly fertile, from these several reasons taken together, we may safely conclude that all our domestic breeds are descended from the rock pigeon, or Columba livia, with its geographical subspecies. In favour of this view, I may add, firstly, that the wild Columba livia has been found capable of domestication in Europe and in India, and that it agrees in habits and in a great number of points of structure with all the domestic breeds. Secondly, that although an English carrier, or a short-faced tumbler, differs immensely in certain characters from the rock pigeon, yet that by comparing the several sub-breeds of these two races, more especially those brought from distant countries, we can make, between them and the rock pigeon, an almost perfect series. So we can, in some other cases, but not with all the breeds. Thirdly, those characters which are mainly distinctive of each breed are in each eminently variable. For instance, the wattle and length of beak in the carrier, the shortness of that of the tumbler, and the number of tail feathers in the fantail. And the explanation of this fact will be obvious when we treat of selection. Fourthly, pigeons have been watched and tended with the utmost care, and loved by many people. They have been domesticated for thousands of years in several quarters of the world. The earliest known record of pigeons is in the 5th Egyptian dynasty, about 3000 BC, as was pointed out to me by Professor Lipsius. But Mr. Birch informs me that pigeons are given in a bill of fare in the previous dynasty. In the time of the Romans, we hear from Pliny, immense prices were given for pigeons. Quote, Nay, they are come to this pass, that they can reckon up their pedigree and race. End quote. Pigeons were much valued by Akbar Khan in India about the year 1600. Never less than 20,000 pigeons were taken with the court. End quote. The monarchs of Iran and Turan sent him some very rare birds. End quote. And continues the courtly historian. Quote, his majesty, by crossing the breeds, which method was never practised before, has improved them astonishingly. End quote. About this same period, the Dutch were as eager about pigeons as were the old Romans. The paramount importance of these considerations in explaining the immense amount of variation which pigeons have undergone will likewise be obvious when we treat of selection. We shall then also see how it is that the several breeds so often have a somewhat monstrous character. It is also a most favourable circumstance for the production of distinct breeds that male and female pigeons can be easily mated for life, and thus different breeds can be kept together in the same aviary. I have discussed the probable origin of domestic pigeons at some yet quite insufficient length, because, when I first kept pigeons, and watched the several kinds, well knowing how truly they breed, I felt fully as much difficulty in believing that since they had been domesticated, they had all proceeded from a common parent, as any naturalist could do in coming to a similar conclusion in regard to the many species of finches, or other groups of birds, in nature. One circumstance has struck me much, 
namely that nearly all the breeders of the various domestic animals and the cultivators of plants with whom i have conversed or whose treatises i have read are firmly convinced that the several breeds to which each has attended from so many aboriginally distinct species ask as i have asked a celebrated raiser of hereford cattle whether his cattle might not have descended from longhorns or both from a common parent stock and he will laugh you to scorn i have never met a pigeon or poultry or duck or rabbit fancier who was not fully convinced that each main breed was descended from a distinct species van mons in his treatise on pears and apples shows how utterly he disbelieves that the several sorts for instance a ribston pippin or codlin apple could ever have proceeded from the seeds of the same tree innumerable other examples could be given the explanation i think is simple from long continued study they are strongly impressed with the differences between the several races and though they well know that each race varies slightly for they win their prizes by selecting such slight differences yet they ignore all general arguments and refuse to sum up in their minds slight differences accumulated during many successive generations may not those naturalists who knowing far less of the laws of inheritance than does the breeder and knowing no more than he does of the intermediate links in the long lines of descent yet admit that many of our domestic races are descended from the same parents may they not learn a lesson of caution when they deride the idea of species in a state of nature being lineal descendants of other species End of chapter one part one